Ja, schon kaut. Test, test. Internet. Google. Oh, that's great. Yeah, we've got backup sound here, so that's uh, that's very useful. Thank you very much. We've been recording one file for the okay. whole day. Speaking okay? Ooh, press cut. Um, <laughs> cut when talks are even cut when people don't tap in, cut when they've unplugged their laptop and press and that stuff. Time to fade and then. Oh, that's if you want to do a. If you do that and then. So you may want to do that at the beginning. If you see. So yeah, we'll try and have a copy of the file when we're done. But we'll want to turn off time to fade. If we're switching for slides. So when Jeremy switches slides. Are we recording? Yes we are. Okay. James, are we ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry about the slight delay. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome to the uh, energy efficient uh, computing dev room. Uh, I'm Jeremy Bennett. Uh, I run a company called Ember Cosm, and I'm the lead engineer on the Magic project, uh, which is machine guided energy efficient compilation, about which we'll hear more later today. This first talk. Um, is really just to give a summary of why we've gone to the effort of inviting people to be part of this dev room, why we've set up a dev room, why we think this is important. Um, can I just check, how many people came to the talk on who ate my battery last night? Right, okay, so I'll try not to repeat. Most of this is just about going into a little bit more depth and setting the scope for today. Um, Uh, this is what we're trying to avoid. This was a headline on the BBC website uh, a year or two ago, observing that on mobile phones, if you have free applications, your battery goes flat quicker because your free applications are running all these nice, exciting adverts trying to grab your attention, and they drain the battery like no tomorrow. Um, and one of the key things we observe is that battery life actually is dropping, not in terms of the size of the batteries. Batteries are getting bigger and bigger. Your battery 10 years ago would have had about 700 milliamp hours. My Galaxy S4 has about 2,600 milliamp hours. The trouble is we're trying to run huge, powerful processors, running web browsers, uh, all sorts of connectivity, as well as making phone calls. But one of the things I want to get across today is that this is not just an issue about my battery phone, my battery life running out. It is an environmental issue at the biggest level. Um, the figure I quoted yesterday, Google spends about a billion dollars on electricity each year. It burns about a gigawatt just running its servers. Um, so it is about a dollar a watt a year to run anything if you're Google size, and that's a giga dollar going out the door. So from straight profitability as a corporate drive to reduce energy consumption, if you could reduce the amount of power their servers used, you could actually build fewer power stations. We did actually do an estimate for the UK government of how much power you would save. And in the UK, if you've got the sort of energy efficiency that the technology we'll talk about today can do, we reckon you could close three power stations. The other thing is something that's slightly invidious, which is that actually a lot of this energy usage from an environmental point of view, you don't see because 
It's not done in great big power stations by the Googles of this world. You can see that, that's very visible. It's done in individual homes with individual pieces of equipment. And one of the killer pieces of equipment in your home is the router. If you're streaming a video from Netflix, it'll be cached locally at your ISP. It'll be done terribly efficiently until it gets to your home. 97% of the energy required to watch a video is in the home. And that energy <coughs> is of the order of 650 watts per gigabyte. So you watch an hour long episode or something, an hour and a half, that's about a gigabyte. That's about as much as having an electric fire on during the video you're watching. And it is a challenge because there is moderate, there's only moderate incentive. You don't see that cost going. You notice your electricity bills going up, but it's very hard to see the transparency. It's actually your router doing it. It's actually your PC doing it. Your PC is the other <coughs> big one in the home that you send you. You can these days get, at least if you put Linux on it and don't waste money on Microsoft, you can get a top of the range 32 gig i7 computer with a couple of terabytes of disk. You can build that yourself for about five or 600 pounds. Five or six hundred euros. You will spend over the two or three years you keep it three or four times that much on the electricity to run it. But because you don't see it, it's just part of your bill you get every month. You don't realise that. So there's an environmental problem there. That's why, actually, in this area, legislation matters. One of the things that came in a few years ago is the European Union started saying that standby currents had to be really low. Up until then, if you had a piece of equipment like your video player, when you put it on standby, all that it did was it turned on a little red LED to tell you it was on standby. So it actually burned more power in standby because it actually had to power the LED. Um, that's changed now. These days, when you turn things off, they will typically only use a handful of milliamps, not half an amp or an amp. The mobile phone we've already talked about. We already know that one. You don't need legislation there because if you can make your phone last for hours and hours, then people will be very happy. I'm impressed. My old laptop, the battery lasted for about two or three hours. This laptop, the battery lasts six hours. The replacement for this laptop, which is now available, the battery lasts 14 hours. So there is a big commercial incentive and Samsung, which is to make this particular laptop, make a big thing of the fact buy our Ultrabook because our new one lasts 14 hours. Here's the one um, that actually is not one that's immediately obvious but has a perfectly good commercial driver. A lot of remote sensing goes on these days. In fact, it's the big growth area. That's why we've got Internet of Things here as a big activity. We put remote sensors everywhere. This one's of an electricity meter. The cost of that is actually the guy who comes out and replaces the battery every 10 years. And as one of my colleagues pointed out, the electricity company couldn't get around to replacing his battery for a year and a half. So he had a year and a half of free electricity. That's just stupidity from the electricity company, but it is a cost. And if you can actually make that battery need to be changed every 11 or 12 years, you make a big saving uh, to the man family to change it. But other sensors are in other pla are in places where changing the battery isn't just expensive, it's almost impossible. Strain gauges under bridges, really hard to put in place. Deep sea sensors. If you want to go and send a sensor to the bottom of the sea, you're going to want it to run for two or three weeks before you bring it to the surface to transmit its data. So all sorts of remote sensing has an incredible motivation to have very low energy consumption. And the industry objective is certainly that these sort of meters, a standard AA cell, should last for 10 years. And lastly is energy scavenging. Now, energy scavenging draws on tiny amounts of electricity. So this one's a little hobbyist thing, a little Zigbee uh, transmitter that can pick up stray electromagnetic radiation and get enough energy to run the compute, to run the Zigbee protocol. But other applications are devices that are implanted in the body, so you don't have to plant a battery with them, sensor devices that can pick up scavenging. And those um, devices use incredibly low amounts of power nanoamps, nanowatts, nanoamp currents, nanowatts of power. And uh, we'll be hearing a little more, I suspect, from Simon Hollis about that because he has sitting on his desk 
a very large piece of equipment which is like a multimeter except it's for measuring pico hours and you can sense when someone walks into the room because of the amount of current flowing through the room. Um, so the message here is that what we're talking about today is actually very broad spectrum, everything from the nanowatt to the gigawatt. Um, and it's an area where it's not just a hardware problem, it's a software issue as well. And to illustrate this, we have this graph. Now this graph comes from me and Kirsten Ada, but actually the bottom four bars come from mental graphics and are based on actual scientific experiments to work out how much you can save energy in hardware design. The top four are speculative by me and Kirsten looking at what we think conceptually is the potential you could achieve if you start involving other things. So the bottom four layers are silicon chip design, from the layout, how you put things on the actual silicon, to the gate level, how, where, how you connect your NAND and NOR gates up, to the RTL synthesis level, where you're talking about registers, uh, uh, flip-flops, and how you organise theirs, up to the architectural level, do I put a cache here, a cache there, um, do I have a big cache, a little cache, do what sort of pipeline do I have? But above that, you start to get into the edge where software matters. These bottom four bars, hardware guys are brilliant. They can change the voltage. They can change the frequency. They can clock gate every circuit. They can give you sleep modes. And I quoted the example yesterday of one of the little 8-bit AVR uh, chips, which, if you run it on its standard configuration with a 2 megahertz clock at 3 volts, in standby, it'll take about 290 microamps. So, the best part of a milliwatt. Now that's pretty efficient, but if you don't need the compute power, if actually you only have to do the occasional little bit of sensing, you can run it at 32 kilohertz, that flow frequency, you can drop the voltage to 1.8 volts, and then it'll use four microamps at 1.8 volts. So that's about eight microwatts instead of one milliwatt. Huge potential there. And that's been achieved by the hardware guys. The issue is that the software people have not been actually told. So we think if you look at the instruction set architecture and start to think about issues about how you design your instruction set, you can make further savings. If you actually think about your programming languages and have programming languages that can help you program for energy efficiency, and we'll be hearing more about that later today, you can make still more savings. My speciality, you can improve the compiler, and we'll hear from James Pallister later about how some of his work can take a program compiled with minus 03 and then, in some cases, half the amount of energy it uses. As it happens, it also speeds up by twice as much as well. So the compiler can make a big difference. And again, of course, the people at the top who can make the biggest difference are the people who write the application. Now, the, what, the best example I know about is an embedded Linux system, which was using far too much power. It's a simple embedded Linux system that you could plug a little console in to check it was working. And they spotted what the problem was. That console had a flashing cursor. So the Linux system had to wake up twice a second to flash the cursor on, to flash it off. They turned the flashing cursor off, and the energy consumption went down by 70%. So if you're an application engineer, you can make big differences. Of course, to make that decision, you had to be able to measure the energy. And that's a big theme that will come out today, is about, as software engineers, I can only solve the problem if I can see it, and we'll hear a lot more about that later. So, just to have a look at what this actually means, these potential savings. Suppose we had a one watt design. Well, if we improve the layout of the silicon, we might get it down by 20 of a watt. If we start to think about actually how we use our gates, our NAND gates, our NOR gates, we might get it down by 0.9 of a watt. We start looking at the RTL synthesis level, or the actual blocks of, uh, of gates and flip flops and so forth, we'll get down to perhaps 0.8 watt. We start thinking about the architecture, how do we design that cache and that pipeline? That's when you start to make big savings, and you can protect, potentially get down to a fifth of that. So instead of your battery going flat in one hour, it goes flat in five hours. But we think when you go above there, better instruction set architecture is probably double that. Now I've got a 10 hour battery better programming languages, where I can say, this doesn't matter, you can do this in low energy, this thing's got to be done quickly, burn a bit of power to get it done, maybe we can get it down to 0.5 watt. Now, at this stage, our one hour battery life has become a 20 hour battery life. 
the compiler we already know can do a doubling of performance. So that's going to get me up to a 40, 50 hour of battery life. And lastly, if we don't go around flashing cursors when we don't need to, potentially we can get a hundredfold improvement. So we think there is actually a potential all the way through the stack to make our devices a hundred times more efficient. We need to prove that because it turns out actually software engineers haven't done a tremendous amount of that um, over the years. And what you'll learn today is about some of the initiatives going on. And the great thing about them is how much of that is open source. And that's why ultimately this problem is only going to be solved if everyone takes part. And we're not going to achieve that by keeping it all secret. Looking at what we're going to do today, we're going to have a look at some of the research end of things. And this stuff is open research, and that tends to be the approach that's used. We've, they've all got acronyms, and you'll learn what they're, they're about in due course. Interestingly, this research, almost exclusively, is not pure academic research. It's joint industrial academic. It's funded by organizations like the European Union, who insist on it being joint between companies and uh, governments. It's funded by organisations like the Technology Strategy Board in the UK, who again say, yes, we'll fund research, but the company had better be leading and the university following. So ECOF is actually a student project. They'll tell you about how you can set up a software framework which allows you to have API calls in your program to keep an eye on how much power you're using. We're here from Speedo, which is a collaboration between Cambridge University and Ultrasoc, who make debug hardware to try and get more efficient, efficient debug visibility of energy. We'll hear from Entra, Energy Transparency, a huge European project to make sure software engineers can see the problem. How do we make it so when you run your program, your boss comes to you and say, how fast did it go, how small is it? And the third question I never ask, how much power is it burned? We'll hear about ECOF. Uh, I've got ECOF in there twice, that should say MAGI. A machine guided energy efficient compilation. I've actually left out my own project, so we'll hear about Magic. We'll also hear from in industry. So Emilia Monti is going to come here and talk about uh, Embed, which is an ARM NXP rapid prototyping platform. And he's going to talk about it, particularly in the context of its use for uh, energy efficiency. And then finally, the big thing we're doing today is we've got a workshop, a three hour workshop from lunchtime where we'll be letting you get your hands on one of these. Um, we've got 50 of them here. This little board on top, it's for measuring the energy consumption of, uh, of computers. One of the things we found when we started this research was you can do this stuff, but the kit costs thousands of pounds. What we wanted was something cheap. So even in the low volumes that we make this, this costs tens of euros. It's a cheap little board. It's, it's only the board on top I'm showing you. This thing underneath is a standard ST Discovery ARM board. It's to take the results and process them and split them out on USB. It's the board on top that has the measurement. That can measure your energy consumption six million times a second. James up there has managed to get it just about to the stage where he can measure the energy used by a single instruction on a computer. We'll be teaching you how to use these. If you last through the workshop, we'll give you them to take away, thanks to, thanks to the generosity of the UK Technology Strategy Board, who paid for 50 of these kits. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing today. It's dev room, it's participatory. Ask questions, interrupt, um, tell us what you think. The idea is not just for us to push stuff out that way. What we've learned is every time we talk about this, we get a tsunami of good ideas. Have you considered doing this? And so we're expecting to go away today with a fantastic array of ideas of all sorts of people, what you could do, how you could do really serious energy measurement. And that's me done. Uh, the next up is Simon Hollis from Bristol University. Simon uh, designed the energy measurement board. He's going to actually take us through some of the basic physics of energy and software. Uh, which will set the framework for understanding what we're doing. Um, while Simon is setting up, uh, any questions? Yes? So you mentioned 650 watts watching a video. Did you mention towers? I'm sorry, yes, I'm sorry, yes. 
there is a slide which I gave yesterday, I didn't do it, about making sure you don't get muddled up between energy and power. I meant what hours. Um, in other words, um, power is how fast you use energy. Energy is the multiply the time by the power that you're going to integrate the power and the energy. Where the power it, come from? it comes from a paper by Kate Craig Wood um, uh, where she did an analysis of uh, the energy consumption on media, internet mediated transactions. If you look for Kate Craig Wood, um, uh, energy of internet transactions on Google, you will find it. It was just research commissioned by the Energy Efficient Computing Special Interest Group of the Technology Strategy Board, which is more accurate than you care to think about. She's at Surrey University, she's also an industrial uh, uh, scientist, uh, and it's a pretty thorough review of the research. Any other questions? Yes, in back. Um, I mean, you are now measuring applications and uh, machines. Do you also connect connected with the supply? Like, when you have a certain energy supply, like by a solar panel, that's like kind of. Uh, um, you have only supply a certain amount of energy, you have a supply of certain amount of energy per day, and it only peaks at specific hours, so we connect it also to the supply, and then. We have we haven't worked in that area. I mean, one thing you learn when you start doing this is quite how wide the spectrum is. We focus on looking at individual computers, so we tend to be um, uh, connecting across the power supply of computers to measure that. But it all fits into a bigger framework of how do you fit into strategic energy supplies? You know, what do you do about internet and energy supplies and so forth? And there are people looking at things like why do we pump? energy to data centres. So we've got these wind farms up in Scotland, we've got our data centre in London. Why don't we put a computer at the bottom of actually the wind farm? Because then it's a lot easier, a lot less energy to pump the data once you've processed it than to pump the energy to process the data. So yeah, there's a huge range of things to do. Right, I'm going to unplug and in two minutes I'll hand over to Simon Collins. Thank you very much. Can, can, Simon, can you sort out yeah. this camera because it keeps drifting downwards? In a second. Cool. Where is the drift? Is it in that? Um, so it's in the vertical. Yeah, so that's just. It's. Um, it's not that. It's, it's this thing. Oh, 
just give me some of the Yeah, we got. It's only just top. Has that? That's on as tight as. That's slightly better, isn't it? No. <coughs> okay, that's fine. Support the camera. I'm just gonna move the tripod up a bit. <laughs> Oh yes, do you want me to... How do you want me to line the shot? And um, so... With the slide? Yeah, with the slide. We have 92 minutes, by the way. I'll stay this side. Wait, it's still... Still drifting. <coughs> it's not that, it is that, it's just that. Is the camera too far forward? Maybe. The, the that seems better. Still drifting slightly. So it's in my bag over there. Have I got a minute? Maybe we should start now, really. Is that okay? Then you'd have to change the battery or the stop. 
So that's a very finite supply. So the more you can make efficient use of that, the longer you can really good in price work. It comes at a cost. Uh, Joe mentioned you know, a billion dollars for Google. Well, it comes at a cost even for me. You know, I make a decision about whether to turn my server on and off at the night because I can save a good proportion of my electricity bill. Um, but that's not generally made aware to the consumer. And so what we want to do is to make it aware to programmers that when they have the programming choices, they can see differences in the output of their code. <coughs> and then actively make a choice to produce more <coughs> So that's about energy. We're also going to talk about power. And devices are now also limited amounts of power. So not just a total amount of energy they can take, but they how quickly they're going to display power. And there's some really good reasons for that. They're cooling limitations. Um, so my phone, which I've just left at the back there, has a cooling limit of 2.5 watts. If I use any more power than that, I'll burn the hand of the user. And they'll see. So this is a design constraint. I can't violate it. I can get past this a little bit, I can drill holes, and then I get about three watts, three and a half watts. Um, after that, I will burn the user again. So that's a real hard limit. That's human speak to me. Um, we've got battery efficiency. So as you increase the amount of power you take out of battery, it becomes less efficient. So the total energy available in the system reduces if you take it at a faster rate. And that's the chemistry. So we care about power, so we'd like to reduce it. And then there's cost. If I have a system that has a bigger power supply, because I need to take more peak power, the highest power that I'm going to take, it will cost me more to build that power supply and the power supply will be bigger. And that has a cost and miniaturization. So these are really good reasons to worry about both energy and power. <coughs> in everything that we do. Um, so we just get straight the fundamentals here. We have energy, which is this physical quantity that measures the work available to do in the system or the work that we've done in the system. Um, and that we can relate to the amount of computation that we can perform. So there's some efficiency of computation compared to the amount of energy you put in. And if you said that was fixed, then if you've got more energy, you can do more computation. <coughs> in electronics, um, the energy goes as heat. It heats up. That's how we lose the energy. So your battery turns into a portable electric heater, and that's what happens in your, in your water devices. In winter time, I put my hands over on this side of my laptop. It's a nice warm feeling. And that's how we use of the energy. <coughs> so this is physical quantity, and this is the limit of the mass we'll ever do today, but we'll have a little bit of mass this all. Um, so we've got energy, E, and we've related to power. So power is this rate of change um, of energy, and so that can perform this integral. This will turn out to be very useful later when we want to do energy measurement, because what we can do is do power measurement from the integration, and then we get a lot of energy. <coughs> and both have these uses, right? So I've shown you use cases where you need to limit energy, and also you want to limit power. So that's why it's nice to be able to do that. <coughs> um, so to give you an idea about how this works in practice, what you actually do is you make a series of measurements. And so here is a scenario where you make power measurements over time. And what you gain are little thin bars. And there's a reason there's a gap between these bars, and that's that typically what you do is measurement, and there's a rest period when you calibrate the next measurement, and then you read that in. So you get gaps, <coughs> and you get instantaneous measures. So you don't get the full continuous knowledge. <coughs> but you get this idea. So you get the idea here is the system is taking a bit of power and then take less power. And it varies around it. You can convert that easily into energy. If you have that set of measurements, you've got a set of power measurements now through time. You can say lots of things about power consumption of the device. You can also then perform the integration process, which just measures the area under the curve. And now you have energy. So the volume under the curve, the area under the curve is the energy and the measurements of power. So you get both at once. You just measure the power, and you have everything you need for energy, and more. <coughs> so energy is typically that ultimate metric that you want to measure, because you want to maximize your battery life. Um, and you can say some things that are nice. Um, if you know the amount of energy in your battery, you know the amount of energy your computation takes, you could say things like, well, I have 10 minutes more video time of energy. And that's kind of it's very useful to a, a user of a device. You can say, okay, well, you could be watching the film, but you won't get to the end. And then you won't be able to make a phone call either. So that's a choice you can actually make. Say, well, I don't care about phone call. I wonder what's the moment to my phone. <coughs> but there's a big problem in computer science, which is that now we produce many applications that don't terminate. This is all the same to things like APC systems, where you have a big computation, it runs some amount of time, and it ends, and you get results back. But most devices now, embedded devices, just run kind of forever or best ever in a loop. So sensors will never terminate. Um, 
little device going to my toaster, they never terminate, as long as the toaster is still turned, it's checking the button, and it's been pressed. And so you can't actually measure the total energy of the application until it never finishes. And we sat around to it the of the universe. <coughs> so from this point of view, uh, it actually makes more sense in terms of to measure the power. Because then you get an idea of what's going on right now. And you can, of course, collect the power measurements and say, this is the range I care about, do the integration of the curve I just did, and then um, you know the system. <coughs> So the power is doing the thing we want to measure. So we had the option. We could have measured energy directly. But managing power turns out to be more generically useful. We can get energy, we can also get more information, and we can do with programs of data on it. <coughs> and thankfully, it's easier to measure as well. So it's a win-win situation here. Um, so that's what we do. That's what we choose to measure in a modern computing system. We'll measure the power it takes, and then do the maths later. <coughs> so what I'm going to do now is just go a quick bit into the fundamentals of where the energy is going, um, where the power is being dissipated, and uh, then go on to show how we can measure all this. <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so we're going to just recall a little bit of kind of schoolboy physics. Um, we've got joules first of all, which says the power of my system is the current of my system, I um, squared times the resistance of the system. Okay, so if I have current and resistance, I can measure power. And so that suffices to know if I can fix the resistance, which is the thing that I probably want to do in this scenario, then I only have to measure current. I measure one thing, I know one thing, and I can measure the power of the system. <coughs> the problem is that if you apply this to a computer, the resistance changes. The effect of resistance really changes depending on what's happening. So that R is no longer fixed. Um, so I can measure the current, potentially, but the resistance I don't know. It'll be different whether I'm doing one instruction to another instruction to whether some of the sleep mode and my sleep mode I can't measure. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to deploy Ohm's law to just rearrange a bunch of these terms in the expression. And what you see here is basically I can rearrange these things any way I like. So I can look for voltage based on the current and the resistance of a system. I can um, look for resistance based on the over the current. And I can start substituting in some various terms of joules. So I can find Laws together, I can get to this one here, which doesn't require me to know any resistance in my system. So that means that if I could measure the voltage and the current at the same time, then I'll be able to derive the power of that. And know the if I do know the resistance, I'm going to measure it. And so this means actually I have a choice of how to do measurements, because we can choose which is the easiest thing in a particular scenario to do. Um, and we can get away with. <coughs> so we're going to come back to that when we show how to build the system. Um, but now we remember resistance capacitors um, and say these are the things fundamentally take um, the energy of computation. So I'm going to talk about an area called dynamic power dissipation here, which is the thing that isn't just I've got a slab of silicon and I'm warming it up by just having a voltage across it. That's another part of the influence of the circuit. But this is what happens when we do computation. We, we use these elements and uh, they dissipate. So here's my transistor. This is a modern MOSFET type transistor. The symbol on the left, and this is a very simplified diagram of what it looks like, what it used to look like maybe 20 years ago, but now it's, this will be jagged all over the place due to wonderful um, effect physics. <coughs> so we've got two different types of silicon, two different of silicon here. <coughs> and the idea is that this transistor will be able to be switched according to a voltage on the gate here and if it's switched on current passes between these two blocks of n type silicon and when it's switched off current's not able to pass through that area called the channel and this block is on that side turns off so this is a device you can turn on you can turn off based on the voltage from the gate <coughs> and if you move the voltage from the gate you will dissipate power why well the first thing is these essentially you can go one point of view, the two materials, they're separated together and they're unconnected. So, whenever, well, I've had a little capacitor. So this is a lovely parallel structure. That's how we, our industry has done so well, making these big, mass-produced, very flat devices. So I've got a big parallel structure, so what I've built myself is a parallel deck capacitor. <coughs> and it's about as long as a transistor. <coughs> so, if I change the voltages at any point in the circuit, I actually start charging and discharging the capacitor system at that point in the circuit. So, that means that I have to do some work. Um, 
a microprocessor, like this ARM based microprocessor we have on here. Um, I've not had one. Anything you can think of produces this FPGA sampling method. Um, so you apply a voltage in to an input from the ADC, give it a reference, you know, ground, zero volts, <coughs> and it measures that voltage for you. And it gives you out a digital value. And it gives you some resolution. So 12 bits is quite common, just resolution. And there you have your number. You now have measured voltage, you've got a digital representation, you can store it in files. And <coughs> <coughs> Typically, these things work to about two and a half volts in an embedded device, um, and so any volts which are two and a half volts, you can just make it happen. Is it consume enough power to affect the measurement, or is it very? It consumes a huge amount of power. Um, <laughs> I have a, a, a short slide about later, but the ADC is actually one of the most power-hungry components of any device, and you'll find them as well. Um, so, what we do actually with the boards, the, the workshop, the open book design, is we separate this out and separate boards. So they have separate boards, and you don't care about the power that board uses. Um, you know, the, you know, the, the, the impedance time is sort of affecting the results as well. It's towards the impedance time over the, the on the virtual. Yes, the impedance is, is virtually infinite. In fact, when it's, when it's measuring, it's infinite because it's disconnected mm -hmm. internally. So they have, a, they have a sample followed by a conversion mechanism. So it is quite good. But yes, they're really powerful. So yeah, there's a demo I think you might use later where you turn on the ADC and you can see the energy consumption board is going up So this is a big disadvantage, but if you have a separate device, you then it's okay. It's a great question. Um, one of the problems that we encounter though is that um, these devices typically work with about 2.5 volts, it seems to be an okay, energy um, And often your power supplies may be higher voltages. Right? They may be 5 volts, 3 volts, 240 volts. Who knows? <coughs> Now, we can actually do some really simple electronics to bring down any higher voltage into that measurement plane. And this is the, the obvious thing to do. First thing we want to do, we build this picture called a potential divider. It uses two resistors, and that allows us to drop a high range of voltages into a small amount. And it's determined by the equation that's up there, and V out is the voltage in times the ratio of resistors. So if we want to halve the voltage range, so we have zero to five volts, we put two identical resistors in that, we'll get to zero to two five volts out. And then we bring it into range of the ADC. So that's that's fine, that's nice and easy. Um, and we will we'll do that when we need to. <coughs> uh, one of the problems with this design is you get this current flow through the resistors. You basically put another tap between the power supplies. And so uh, you have to account for that. So if this power supply here is power supply that you care about, so the microprocessor you're measuring, then you're actually adding current onto its, onto its component. And that means you'll get false results about the power consumption. It'll be off by the amount of current that goes through there. But thankfully, these are fixed resistors. You pick them you know, off the shelf, and they have values. So you can account for that, but you've just got to remember to adjust your results. Your process actually takes less current than you thought it did, because you're wasting current in your measurement. And this is the kind of thing that can affect results if you're not careful about it. You've got to remember to do it. <coughs> Nothing hard, but you don't do it, you'll get errors. <coughs> um, that is the one, that is the backup side. So what we do now is we want to measure current. Most commonly is we measure the voltage pair. And we use Ohm's law in order to transform the measurement of current into a measurement of voltage in a known resistance. The I squared R relationship. So we use Ohm's law. And um, what we'll do is we'll place a known resistance across a power supply. So if you look here, I've got a microprocessor supply here. There's the main power supply coming out of a battery. And I place a known resistance in that wire. 
then what I do is I get a small voltage appears across the resistor based on how much current flows, and I can measure that. But it's a differential thing, so what I have to do is actually pass it through uh, the thing that measures the difference in the voltages rather than the absolute voltages before passing it on to the EDC. And this guy is called a differential amplifier. So it takes the voltage here at the top on the red line, minus the voltage on the blue line, and that's the output. <coughs> So you can you don't care whether this is five volts or three volts, it's going to be a difference across the system. If you direct the proportion to the other um, current. The problem with this approach is that this resistor you have to put it into your power supply somewhere. And that's about how you spend a lot of our free time. But it's an amazing mechanism. If it's not already there, which probably will be, um, then you've got to insert. And you've got to pick the right kind of resistance value so that you don't stop circuit working. If you've got a really big resistor in the power supply, you just can't supply enough power to the microprocessor, so the microprocessor will fall over. If you have it too small, you get a very, very small voltage appearing across the resistor, it's very hard to measure. Tiny ball, 0 0.00 or something. Close. <coughs> so you need to select carefully. Um, here's my guidelines. Um, well, most every microprocessor will deal with up to 0 0.05 volt change in power supply without care. It's normally specified in the data sheet that that's an absolutely fine range to be in. <coughs> and so, um, if you want to maintain that as a maximum drop across your power supply, these resistor values, which happen to be exactly the same as the ones on our measurement board, uh, are in cover this range, which is the range of typical microprocessors. Right? So, anything from uh, microprocessors microwatts and then up to something from take a full out. And some of the more powerful arm boards we have taken take over that one. And so, this range, which a resistor gives you the allowed voltage drop, but it is still very small. So what you're now doing is feeding this kind of voltage into the ADC converter in a microprocessor, which has a range of 0 to 2.5 volts. So you're using some tiny, tiny part of that range. What you want to do is to maximize the part of the range that you use, because that gives you more resolution, it gives you more um, points inside the range that you can distribute. So what we do is we actually amplify in the analog domain the voltages that we see. So we don't just create that differential voltage we also amplify it at the same time. And the thing that we do is we amplify by a factor of 50, and that then scales up 0 0.05 volts into 2.5 volts. So we can then cover the exact range that the ADC is sensitive to. Um, fully. <coughs> and that makes it much more useful. So your question then is how do you build that, that amplifier, differential amplifier? Well, that's the stuff of kind of e electronics engineering students the world over in their first year. Um, you can use this device called an operational amplifier well known, well tested, um, it's very easily available off the shelf, and you build exactly this circuit. So you got three connections on the device, so a differential input, it's got an output, and then what you do is you add in this thing called feedback, which gives you, um, again, an amplification ability. And you can set these resistors, so 50 times gain, I set this one here to um, 50,000 ohms, and this one to 1,000 ohms. <coughs> And you can find that technical with absolutely nothing to do that. And then what we do is just take that trip resistance part of that power supply. The downside to this is when I started just thinking, well, shall I build this circuit since we make boards based on it? Um, you find that weird things. Like the fact you've got four resistors here adds more costs to the assembly of your, of your measurement than it does to buy the operating amplifier. Um, and that's because assembly, the robot has to now go and go to four more places and put four more resistors. And We've got two different values and the natural cost of making it. So if you wanted to mass produce this, there's a way forward to attract it. <coughs> and it's uh, annoying, breaks on layout, it doesn't look so pretty, all sorts of things. Um, so we can actually buy off the shelf dedicated current sense amplifiers. They're designed exactly for this application across the cross resistor. And they have fixed um, amplification. And there is indeed one that gives 50 times amplification. Uh, we use one from Maxim. They produce a range of these devices with calibratable ranges um, and one or four different inputs, different inputs. So you can measure up to four power supplies at once, and that's what I said our boards do. <coughs> and you do all of this and it's a relatively expensive chip, but it's nice and The devices have this fundamental limit called bandwidth, which says what is the fastest that I can amplify? What's the fastest signal that I can amplify? And these devices actually have very low bandwidth and that's because they amplify so high. Times. Um, and they go up to about 2 megahertz. And what that means is that 
you can't measure accurately a signal that's three million passes a million times a second. Million times. You use these devices, there's no point in measuring faster than that because they don't have a bandwidth of power and what's necessary. <laughs> There's no point in there? There's, well, there's not quite no point, there's little points in that because the what you've done is you've created a system where, where go back to this diagram. So you've got a system here. If this can measure very, very quickly, you've introduced in the middle a weak link. Okay. Yeah. So this kind of passes all of the information from the resistor into the ADC because it has this limit. And so the ADC can go faster and faster faster because there's no more information to be got. Uh, it's, yes, it's analog, yes. So it's a, it's a function of the transistors that are building that price. Uh, if you drop the amount of amplification, you can push that up. And this is a trade off. There's a fixed trade off between how much you want to multiply the voltage of your signal and how quickly you can do that. And so if you drop that down, and that's why there's a range here, because there's a range of amplification between 20 and 100 times. And if you amplify in 20 times, you get 2 megahertz. If you amplify 100 times, you get 1.3 megahertz. So you have to choose that. So you choose where you lose information. You can see your information. So then for this boundary, uh, let's say we have some uh, circuits that are operating past the higher uh, frequency. Yeah. And we uh, lose some information, or that we will switch to current. You'll lose, yes, absolutely, you'll lose that information. Is that, uh, so there's a really good question about what information is in this point. Um, one of the things that happens when you, when you pass a benefit is it smooths the signal, kind of fundamentally smooths the signal. So the total, if you were to take an infinite number of samples of the output, you'll get the same representation of the total energy. But what you don't know is the shape of the curve. So you don't know when it went up and when it went down, but you will see the total used. So you lose the ability to say, well, it was that part of the loop that, that took a lot of power. Or oh, it was that part. You'll just say, my program took this much. And that will still be an accurate answer. You can't tell where in time. It, it will measure, uh, it will measure, the power readings will be different, but the integral, the total energy will be the same. So your energy figure is still accurate, but you, your, your when it happened is less accurate. And that's something to be really aware of. Uh, that also means that you can't do maths, you can do statistical correlations over repeated measurements to try and gain more information because the total is always the same. <coughs> but that's, that's an annoying thing, it's worth it. Right? You can buy a more expensive device but to push away the computation and build a more expensive circuit. You can always do this, uh, almost always do it. <coughs> and the other thing, the problem is you have with this device is the, the analog digital converter part um, has a built in error because what you're doing is you're taking a continuous quantity, which is voltage. And you're producing a binary value which has a fixed number of digits and so you you can have error um, and that's almost always half of a bit. So when you take a, a value out of measurement, you should always basically discard the least bit or at least average it over the multiple cycles. Because that will essentially randomly flip just depending on exactly how your ADC operates. <coughs> There's minimum conversion time, so the ADC puts a speed limit into the measurement. And that means you can't fast, measure faster than the ABCs. Um, they themselves display power, so there was a question earlier about right, that, that gives bias in the sample, you've got to remember to take that off. And uh, the final one, they generate quite a large amount of data, even a small, quite slow ABC. Uh, excuse me, how do we have to interpret this decision? This stuff? Do Half an LSD, so we significant. Bit, sorry, bit, bit, bit. Uh, bit. Listen, bit. So you've got 12 bit representation, the bottom bit is 0 or 1. Plus or minus 0 0.5. Yeah, I know, no, I think it's not for me. You're right, it's it. Sorry, yes, at least a bit. I don't want to help quite a Give you an idea if you've got a device like this going at a million samples a second, you generate 12 bits in every sample, sample of rest of the data, and you then can max out a USB one. One of the problems we have with this device is that embedded devices tend to be not great at doing USB, so getting the data off here, even though it does USB 2. It can't max out USB 2, we don't have the ability to get off all the data that we can make um, from our devices, even though we only measure these kinds of So that's well worth remembering. So what you can do is you pre-process data, you put a processor lying around, you do that as well. Um, but you do want to say, okay, do I have an idea what's important information? Do I need every sample? And that helps you design your software. 
Yes, yes, absolutely. So the, the power consumption measurement you get is directly correlated to the resistance, the quantity of resistance. So if the resistance changes, then, uh, or is, has a tolerance error, then your measurement is as by that as well. And you can, of course, cut, you can measure the resistance in the scope or in a multimeter, so you can cut it. Um, for this reason, again, <coughs> shame the book, in the open source uh, design, we specify some very tight tolerance resistance, 0.5%. Resistance, so to minimize any differences. Um, so, in the true resistance, someone will observe one master power. What about the juice error? Hmm? What about non linearity of the uh, hmm. UNC? Uh, that, yeah, that, that will be specified in the data sheet um, where, where that happens. Typically, they are internally calculated to produce a linear output um, when you get the binary representation. But so these kind of things depend on the ADC that you use, and you have to read the data sheet. It's always a caveat. So then you normally get a, a, a linear a binary representation, even if it's not a linear response to the answer itself. <coughs> okay, so we've got some other limitations. So uh, I mean, not, everything's not great, right? Um, one of the problems was we had to connect in this shunt resistor into our devices, um, which means we either need a board that has one, or we have to do some desoldering followed by some soldering. So what we have to do is remove one component to make space for a soldering to wires, and then add in whatever you took off, plus your shunt resistor. To give you an idea what these kind of things look like, this is a board we have back in our lab. This is a power supply, it's a one volt power supply. We've got a chip here, it's a power supply chip. Capacitors, this is a switch mode power supply, it's got a ductor in here. Here's the little shunt resistor in this. I've magnified this quite a lot, so it's a really tiny device. But here's a board and it's got little two little probe points and you can put you know, a multimeter in here or you can put the, um, the circuit I've just shown you across these two sockets and then you will get the main. <coughs> and so that's nice. And, uh, fact, but most devices don't have that, so the Beagle, Beagle Bone um, White doesn't have it. Uh, but you have to use this dab hand for soldering, and I think you see this one on the stand if you want to. And in here, there was some power supply components that have been removed, replaced by a bunch of wires and a bunch of glue, and then everything is connected in uh, externally. <coughs> uh, so if you want to do that kind of modification, you need to know which components to take off. Because some of you take it off, it's going to break. Some of you take it off, it won't break. And you need to know where to connect that into. Um, and there's two popular types of power supply, and they have different components. <coughs> um, on small cheap devices, you typically find this thing called a linear power supply. Um, it's good because it's very cheap um, and very small, but it's pretty inefficient, so it's not used for large devices and get too hot. Um, and those devices use things for switch mode power supplies. That's the kind of power supply you've got for a laptop. And, um, it's much more efficient. Uh, these things here, depending on what you put in, might be as bad as 20%, 30% efficient. These ones here are normally 90 Eight plus percent. <coughs> so let's look at the linear one first, simple the two. And um, what it does is says, okay, I've got an input voltage and I've got an output voltage. That's a voltage for the microprocessor, and I'm going to change the difference by just wasting the energy. Okay, so you put in five volts, you've got one volt. It just wastes four volts worth of this, and it's really a, a big kind of step. So there's a representation. It's transistor. It changes value depending on the input voltage you put in there. Um, it's a regulator, and you get out whatever you bought on the package. The package normally specifies 5 volt output, 1 volt output, whatever you get. What you get out. <coughs> so you get a voltage out here, 5 volts goes in, 1 volt might come out, and then you add in the sugar resistor for your motion. Well, you drop a little voltage across that, maybe 0 0.05 volts, <coughs> and that means your processor actually now sees 0.95 volts instead of the 1 volt it was expecting. The processor will still work. But you're not running it at the same condition that you were thought you were. You thought you were measuring it for one volt performance. And as Jeremy mentioned in the previous talk, if you drop the voltage, you become more efficient. So you've actually helped you know, the energy of the system by doing the measurement. Again, you've disturbed the system. <coughs> um, now, with switch mode power supplies, we can actually get away from that. <coughs> because the regulator has this notion of feedback, it can measure the output, and it just saw it. <coughs> and so there's a massively simplified um, diagram of a, of a switch mode power supply. Um, but the switch mode power supply is made by having a switch, a transistor, in series with an inductor, and this switch goes up and down really, really quickly um, to provide power this way, which is then stored temporarily in the inductor. And it looks at the output and says, do I need to connect power supply again? Do I need to connect it? And if the voltage is too low, connect the power supply, if the voltage is too high, it stops. <coughs> 
And so this thing goes up and down, comes it over times a second, and there's a measurement point where feedback comes in to decide whether to close the switch. <coughs> so you've got the shunt resistor in. As long as you put the shunt resistor before the feedback, and it could be in either order with the inductor, and um, either order with the switch, then you will get feedback that ensures that the voltage across there is adjusted for automatically. So what that would look like in the same example, his five volts goes in. Oh gosh. My end button in my um, page down button in the same way. <coughs> it's five volts in, you'll get five one volt out if it's a one volt power supply. And the reason is because, it's, because the power supply will increment on the other side of the shunt system um, automatically. It just says so the shunt system will be there, that would be one volt. Since it's there, it notices that the voltage changes across it. So now you can run your processor at one volt, which is potentially what So it's better from the point of view of being able to make a market and the full condition. <coughs> and then my last thing on this really is how fast can we do this? So we talked a little bit about the electrifier, but there's another part of my system. Once I have a power supply and a resistor and a capacitor, which is at least the input to my um, processor, but normally also another capacitor to make a nice stable power supply. What I've built is this thing called an RC charging circuit. And they're well known because they take time to charge in the tank. And they've got this wonderfully simple relationship, which is the amount of time taken to change the voltage on that capacitor with your power supply output um, is related to our time scale. <coughs> and what that means is at the, at the point where you're coming out of power supply, the voltage can only change so quickly. And it changes the maximum of that speed. And so that limits the rate at which the power supply voltage will change. You'll see a change there. Regardless of if the microprocessor suddenly can get a power supply and say, I want infinite, I want infinite current now, you won't see that for some time on the measurement. You will see it eventually, but you won't see it straight away. And that means that you can then push through values. This is a common linear power supply. If you push through these values, what actually happens is there's a limit to the physics of the, <coughs> the connection. Not, not, not longer the amplification. And it turns out that you buy that very popular off the shelf part of the regulated 5 volt power supply, you will never see a response more than 1.5 microfarads. That means in the signal you wanted to measure, there wasn't anything more interesting than running at that speed that you can see. So even if you had a 500 megahertz processor, you won't be able to see its power supply changing to 500 megahertz because of the damping that the power supply is <coughs> So this actually means, we've got this other thing on Nakers do, it means you need to we measure no point measuring passing three megahertz in this scenario, which you won't see, there's no information available. <coughs> so that's worth bearing in mind, because otherwise you think, well, I just buy a very expensive oscilloscope, and I can measure anything I like. You actually can't, you would never be able to measure it at five megahertz. <coughs> Um, what that means for your output, though, is that if you say, okay, here is my processor, running 500 megahertz, running instructions, with that kind of power supply, you'll never be able to resolve closer together than a block of 300 instructions when you want. So you won't be able to say that app that takes my energy. You'll be able to say, that block of 300 instructions, no, let's go and have a look at it. And this means. <coughs> so if you want better, you've got to re-engineer the entire power supply to the microprocessor for the package. <coughs> And so, whilst this works for a slow device, so I have a slow device, I can say, this is what you're talking about. It's running at 1 megahertz, I can do that. 5 megahertz, I'll never be able to do that. So, again, graphically, you'll never get out this kind of level of resolution of saying, it's this line of my assembly code that took the power. <coughs> but you might be able to say, well, maybe it's that block of code. And maybe it's got that out of So, that's what we're looking at with these kind of measurement devices. And I have, I think, one minute left to just uh, show you what these designs look like when you look at when you scale. If you want to play more with these designs, you have a workshop session, you can come and you can take them home. <coughs> um, so we've got this device, and it's an open source design. Here's the link, you can download it. Uh, we use open source CAD software, and you can download the design from CAD software, generate files and send them out. So we <coughs> uh, four channels, six megs per second, so it would measure accurately everything we've seen today. Full bit resolution. Um, and this is what it looks like. If you zoom in and my hand, we've got this is the amplifier in the middle, the biggest part of the device. We've got a big selection of different shunt resistors that you can insert by connecting to the short. So you have to do some soldering. All you have to do is connect your power supplies into some pins here. So you have to break the power supply trace on the board, take two wires out, and push them to here. 
back here and here, and then that's it. <coughs> then you set some jumpers, little nice red jumpers we've got, um, and this will then do all the work that is designed you know, to be carefully controlled. This thing plugs into um, an, a cheap arm evaluation board. Here, that's a nine euro board. You can buy off the shelf from RAS, Farnell, any of your favourite companies, um, and that then collects the data and has the ADC inside. I think I'll leave the link to my last slide. Um, this is what comes out of it. And you play again in this in the workshop. Um, there's, we have software that takes the USB and you can, can visualise the output of that measurement device on a PC, a laptop, and here we've got the current measurement going through the one probe point, the voltage measurement, and the power. And what you can see here is we weren't doing anything on the target processor, and then we do things. It shoots up and then start flipping around. And that's the block space. So I think with that, I'll just uh, skip to the end and say <coughs> you know, it's very useful to be able to do this because now you can say things like I can say a block of 300 codes on a 5 megahertz processor. Here's my block. That's the block that is taking energy. Let's go and re-engineer that. But a slow processor, I'd say five seconds. <coughs> We've got the open source design. We've downloaded. Take a free kid away today. Uh, you may need to do a little soldering at the level of just breaking a track, soldering one wire, soldering another wire, and then you can put it into our design. Simply as possible. We've got hands on workshops starting at 12. So, with that, I'll leave.